<laughs> also, also on that day, Quick Change came out, which I think is a really entertaining Bill Murray movie. And I, will, yeah. I think that's the, I think that's the one great. Okay, so now we've gone. We've finally gotten to the one uh, really great movie so far this summer. It's and a funny yeah, movie. It, it it is it is now a cult movie. It was not a hit. Uh, it came in under the radar somehow. I don't think they marketed it correctly. I remember seeing the posters on the subway uh, on the subway walls when in New York City and thinking, right. "Boy, what a lame poster! It's just a clown with with balloons and a whole lot of copy, you know, on it." And I no, thought, but it's Boy, a funny it's movie. Crazy. But it is so it's a, hilarious. It's a, it's a really, it's a really good New York City movie too. Yeah, it is. It's 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 it's, it's like it's like a little combo of like it's. Uh, I I would imagine they tried to sell it as uh, you know Dog Day Afternoon meets maybe the Out of Towners or something like that. Yeah, I mean, and mm-hmm. um, and but it's so much better than uh, than well. I think it's better than the Out of Towners and uh, and yeah, uh, mm-hmm. I like. I like how it. Uh, I think it does those things that Neil Simon wanted to do with the out of towners a lot better. But uh, yeah. I, I love I love the uh, the bank part of the movie at the mm-hmm. at the front of it. I mean, I think that it's constantly hilarious. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that it has a very uh, even with its smallest characters. I mean, even with the characters like like Tony Shalhoub as the as the uh taxi driver who can't speak English and the right. and the uh, or um uh, uh Philip Bosco as the as the uh, bus driver he was as the terrible. bus driver who's obsessed with the rules and yeah. and uh um, you know Kurtwood Smith is in there as as one of the villains and uh, uh-huh. there's just so many little character parts in it that it's really packed full for a movie that's you yeah. know less than a little bit over ninety minutes long. Yeah, it's really I will say too. I will say too. There's a line in the movie that I that I always crack up at. I remember the first time watching it. It was the funniest line of the movie. Nobody else laughed. Uh, but I love sarcasm. So when he first goes into the bank and he pulls the gun on the guard, and the, and the guard says something to the effect of, "Please don't. I'm an old man." And Bill Murray says. Really? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize. Uh, I love uh, almost all of that. Uh, that first thirty minutes of it uh, in the bank is like absolute gold. I mean, mm-hmm. it weakens a little bit when it goes out. It kind of goes and fits and starts a little bit, to tell you the truth. It kind of, it you feel it weaken and then you feel it gaining strength and then you feel it weaken again. But there are just so many elements. There are so many scenes in it that are just. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the the scene where they get stranded in the middle of nowhere, and there's there's a woman going, "Flores, Flores, down to Tormentos, Flores, flowers for the dead," you know, and they're like, "I yeah. think we need to get out of here," you know. It's like everything about it is just. Uh, I love it. Super. Yeah, and I, and Rand, it's Randy a good movie. Good in it. It's a solid. So it, it's a solid movie. I mean, it's a solid, so well-made movie. That's a good movie. movie to check out. Is that available on DVD? Do you guys know? Yeah, yeah. And oh yeah, yeah. I think Bill Murray's only uh, only directing credit or co-directing credit. Co- yeah. Co-directing. Well, and he, it was Howard oh. Franklin who did the screenplay and 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 did the other was the other co-director. But next week but, we got yeah, we got to get moving. Great, great movie. Quick change. Uh, July 18th is Arachnophobia. I did not know if I could stand watching this movie since I have such a, t- a paralyzing fear of spiders. You and me but, both. Uh, I did well. I did well watching yeah. it. Yeah. And uh, it, th- talk about a fun movie. It, it, you know, it. I thought it would be just absolutely terrifying. And the and the movie seems to know, it knows that you're terrified by spiders. Yes. And so it's, it's a- but. It, it makes fun of that. I mean, it has fun with that fear. Mm-hmm. What's funny about this one, what I remember this film, a couple of things I remember, I remember they changed the marketing of the film before it came out and then after it came out. That before it came out, I remember the marketing played up kind of the humor of the story of the movie, where mm-hmm. they really had John Goodman kind of prominent. And then once the movie came out, they portrayed it more as a horror film, like... You know, jaws on six legs. And yeah, yeah. The horror anti of it, and uh, I saw it. Uh, I went to a sneak 
preview, one of those, remember when they would do the Saturday night sneaks, national sneak previews? So I saw yeah. the arachnophobia with Pretty Woman. That's a good combo. <laughs> wow, uh, that's quite a combo. I mean, hey man, that's a that's a good night out, man, for a double feature. Yeah, I love that. I, I love, that's a good movie. A little bit and, of uh, everything. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was a big arachnophobia fan. Great, Jeff, great Jeff Daniels performance. One of uh-huh. the best everyman performances. It's got uh, a bit Jill- of a cult uh, yeah. cult following. That movie, I think. Julian Julian Sands. And uh, like I said, uh, John Goodman, he was just, uh, for you know, for all of us, you know, we only knew, you know, we didn't know him as, you know, from Raising Arizona for many movies. He, for us at that time, he was Roseanne's husband. Right, right. No, that's true. That was, that was to sell, you know, Roseanne's well, husband. Well, I will say, I remember, spider. I mean, that, that big, that huge spider was terrifying, but I will say, oh, that yeah. I remember when Jeff Daniels was interviewed and he said the reason why he got the part, they sat him down. And they said, "Do you have any any problem with spiders?" And they put a tarantula on the desk. And uh, and and, and honesty, he did, he was scared of spiders, but he had to kind of play it off like he wasn't. As the tarantula was going, I could not take it, man. I would be like, "No, don't need this movie. Sorry." Mm. All right, July twentieth. I will skip over Navy Seals, which is the Michael Bean, Charlie Sheen, just for time. Why would you do that, I'll, man? And I will go straight <laughs> to the straight to the freshman. I have a little story to tell about the funny movie. I have a little story. Just it's not a great story, but I have a little story to tell about the freshman. In terms of, I knew that uh, I was living in New York, and uh, this was in the late late eighty nine, I guess, probably fall of eighty nine, and I knew that that Brando was filming the freshman, and for some reason, somehow I got got the information that they were filming on the street where uh in New York City where uh the uh cinema the cinema village is. The famed uh indie cinema has been there forever. So they were filming on that street. Um and uh I went down there uh one day to see if I could see anybody, you know. I wanted to see Brando and uh I did get to see him coming out in his pinstripe suit, uh, like looking absolutely huger than I had even imagined him looking. And all I saw him was, I saw him walking past the cinema village and going into uh, a um, a trailer. And I remember looking at the trailer when he got into it and, and imagining that it was <laughs> I don't know if I actually saw this or if I imagined it. But see the sort of trailers sort of tip over a little bit, you know. <laughs> he got oh man. It. That's hard, Steve. It's true. Hard. I, I saw it. I mean it was like it was pretty it, well, it, it was there was some heaviness on that on that trailer. Oh, but Brando Brando I love that movie. That movie. When, when that movie came out, Brando just dissed the hell out of it. He said, this movie is lousy, blah, blah, blah. And then a couple of weeks later, he came out and said, I was completely wrong. I apologize. It's a great comedy, and I'm proud to be a part of it. It was a weird 180 that he did on it. Yeah, mm. you know, but it's a funny, it's a very funny, funny movie. It's a, you can't and, help and done but... by a very reliable director and writer, Andrew Bergman, yeah. who had worked on, mm-hmm. worked on, you know, uh, Blazing Saddles and had done... Movies like and, uh, you know In Laws and so forth. Uh-huh. So, I mean, one of Jamie he wrote one of Jamie's favorites, Fletch. Um, Fletch, right? He worked yeah. on Fletch. Yeah. He did Fletch too. So I yeah. mean, uh, but, but Freshman is is absolutely hilarious. And and one of uh, I love Brando in it, but Matthew Broderick is especially hilarious in it. This movie where they where him and Frank Whaley go to retrieve the Komodo dragon. The Komodo yeah. dragon. And that it's dragon, the, that that that's a great animal performance too in that movie. Well, I, I don't know about I, I don't know about that, but <laughs> it's true. I mean, that, 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 that Komodo I, dragon is funny in that movie. So, uh, so, so you're so was, that's uh, like Park. you have a Brando you have a Brando movie where you're praising the performance of the Komodo dragon. That's like saying <laughs> the best the best performance well, of the Godfather is of the cat that he's said <laughs> that wandered onto the set. I mean, but you get to see no, Brando on ice. No, yeah, but, he's good. Well, the, the highlight, the highlight of Brando in that film, well, the whole thing that he 
that he's playing Vito Corleone without winking at Vito Corleone. Right. But then, then he goes ice skating. In the <laughs> yeah. sequence. I mean, it's just kind of a your jaw. You have kind to see it to believe it. Yeah. And a lot of me, people, also, a lot of people, I, uh, a lot of people died that day. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And the ice, the ice never cracked. I mean, it's yeah. just kind of <laughs> the ice didn't crack. That's funny. But I, I love also. I just have to say, I love Burt Parks in the movie singing singing the songs. Uh, yeah, at the, yeah, at the end good. of the movie, he's. Uh, I mean, again, you know, a, a movie that if you haven't seen it, you know, if you read a quick change in the fresh one in one night, you would get a lot of yeah. laughs in that it's one. It's a night. treat. Oh yeah. What's yeah. What's interesting? Okay. Like, what's interesting to note, just real quick here, is that. You know, talk about evolution or devolution, however you want to look at it. You know, quick change and and the freshman. These were the comedies of the summer, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so it kind of and you know, it, and and now look what comedies of the summer are. It's, I mean, it's quite the, different. You know, so, you know, so this is what you know. This is what the you know at least for at least for summer of ninety. You know, ninety one was probably different, and eighty nine was different. Was mm-hmm. different. But for summer of May, mm-hmm. this is what they gave us for comedy. So it's just and remember, um, you know these movies. Um, you know, Quick Change did not do well, and it's a very funny movie. But it, you know, and the it, freshman was, didn't do well either. I mean, it was no, okay. the freshman was not a hit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there you go. Uh, we're 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 going to go right through the end. Uh, so uh, it'll probably go over eight. So Jerry, if you need to bow out any time, just okay, okay, go ahead and do so. Okay, July twenty seventh. Before John Grisham became you know so popular, there was Scott Turo, and his bestseller was Presumed Innocent. And Alan like, Pakula, I, th- I think the last truly great movie from Alan Pakula was Presumed mm-hmm. Innocent, and and a great like. Uh, you know, we think of it as boring now, but uh, that that side of Harrison Ford. But uh, I think he was really good in Presumed Innocent. Uh, Everyone uh, was good. It was a great cast. I and Raul Julia. Oh my yeah. God! This, this yeah. was one of my favorite movies that summer. This is yeah. No, it was. I, I first I first noticed. I mean, I didn't know him as as a kid. I didn't know the name, but I remember noticing the actor to the point that. Like you know, I would see him on a TV show or see him in another movie. Uh, I'd be like, "Oh, that's that actor from Presumed Innocent," and it's like it's an actor I followed to his death, and that was uh, John Spencer. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I followed. I, I noticed him first in Presumed Innocent to the point I remember when they cast him. I think a year or two later on the last couple of seasons of L.A. Law, and I watched the last couple of years of L.A. Law because they put him on as one of the main lawyers. And right, John right. Spencer, the thing that the thing that John I remember Spencer's about him my, too, he was his one performance of my favorite, in that movie too, yeah. is uh, one of my favorite actors. In the and book, Scott Turo, it, it, yeah. in the book, it makes special mention that John Spencer's character pronounces sterile. He pronounces it sterile, mm-hmm. and John Spencer did it in the movie. Like it was for whatever reason, it was very specifically stated in the book that he mispronounces it. Uh, and it tells tells you what a kind of a smart uh, thinking actor that Harrison Ford was because, you know, the superficial press they were all about Harrison Ford's bad haircut. Right, know, right, right, right. You know that's that's what they focused on, not the fact yeah. that it was a great legal movie. But Harrison Ford said, "I wanted him to look like a guy that would not have an affair, that would not right. be likely to have an affair. You know, he'd be a very unassuming kind of guy, faithful." Good. Yes, but the other thing about this movie, though, if you remember, this is now this is the end of July. This is like considered the first grown-up movie of the summer, you know, because there's been a lot of sequels, a lot of action movies. This was considered by many people to be the first really, truly grown-up drama of the summer. Yeah, the other fun performance that gives it a little funky, you know, little boogie is a uh, you gotta love Paul Winfield. Uh, oh, he's good. Judge, no, it's a great cast. I mean, because yeah. Paul Win- Paul Winfield can't help but like be a little hammy. Yeah, uh, right, right. He's just a little, puts a little grease into his acting. Um, yeah, and so that's fun. Scott Turow, he was kind of like John Grisham, but with talent. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, he 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 didn't write a book every year, but remember this he he had this book, and then he had um. 
what was it? The one pleading guilty. Um, his second book had come out from this well, movie. Well, out. you know, Thoreau, you know, Grisham, Thoreau, uh, like wrote a. Uh, I mean, the the entire plot of Presumed Innocent is really good. Yeah. Uh, with Grisham, he he writes for the movie. I mean, he writes a basic. He writes a great. Uh, uh, like okay. a basic, he he basically writes yeah. a screenplay a, for the movie. A basic and framework, and like every yeah. almost every single Grisham movie, I say, oh man, I mean, it starts out with such a great premise. That's what he writes yeah. well, a premise. Yeah, no, that's and then the, no, just, he writes the then, then they just go to shit. Like the chamber, yeah. it would have been a great premise, but where where's the movie? Uh, you know, yeah. where's the drama in the movie? <clears throat> Anyway, well, Thoreau, okay, uh, I have a question about well, Thoreau. Is he is he a is he a a, a, a um, lawyer as well? I mean, yes, yeah, he was he's a practicing lawyer. He was he wrote he, you know his nonfiction book. Here's a book, question. You know. Yeah. Here's a here's a question about Presumed Innocent. Um, because I hadn't read the book when I saw Presumed. I, I went to the theater to see Presumed Innocent because it was, you know, Han Solo was doing a doing a serious film. So I went. Mm-hmm. I was like Twelve years old. So I was like twelve going to see Presumed Innocent. But uh, so when you all went to the movies, uh, who here had not read the book, and so did you know the ending? I had not I read the, the book ending. before. No, I read the book. So, I, I knew the ending, but it's still, you know, it's okay. still a different okay. thing. So, of the, uh, so Dean and Jamie, so that was a big thing. Did you? Uh, did you did you figure it out, or did you just let the film unfold? No, but when I watch movies, I don't try to figure it out. I I, that that's what, I, I'm with Jamie on that. I don't try and I, I I'm never trying to figure out the movie. Uh, I only sometimes I figure out a movie against my will, like sometimes huh. like like for instance, you know, like with the Sixth Sense, like with the Sixth Sense, I just knew I knew it already. Like so, but uh, but with presume innocent, it didn't work out that way. So I mean, like I, but, I thought but it, it worked just well. That, I thought the Bonnie Bedelia. I had the hots for Bonnie Bedelia after that movie, She's and sweet. then she did some movie, some movie with Roy Scheider about taking pictures for HBO. It was an HBO movie. Somebody oh, has someone to take has pictures. To or something. Oh someone yeah, has someone has to, to be yeah. in the picture. Yeah. Yeah, I, I so I had the hots for Bonnie Bedelia, and that last scene where she confesses, and it just hangs on Harrison Ford's face as you're waiting for the tears to fall from his eyes. And it's incredibly powerful. So and so the, the, the end of the movie has this resonance that you know they are going to be haunted by this. Like, they're, right. they're, not, they're not free and clear of, of what happened, you know. Well, he's going to be haunted. He seems to be okay with it. I, don't I know, know that, that uh, I know oh, that you like does. this movie. It's by Alan Pakula, of course, but I feel like it, it's it's the step down for Alan Pakula for me because I don't feel like it has uh, any of the things that drove him in his previous movies, both as a producer and as a. I, I feel like it's a. I feel like it's a play for a play for box office, really. Well, I mean, it's and, I mean than, he deserves okay. to have that, but yeah, yeah, come on. I mean, I mean, it's not, it's not an, it, 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 it's so artfully done, and it's an intelligent movie. I mean, a play for box office would be, would be, you know, one of well, the, it's a more obvious movie than that. But there's, but there's a, uh, there's a sort of a political. I mean, you know, you can't deny the political elements of of his movies from the seventies right. and so forth, and even his right, movies but from I the sixties, and this doesn't have it, so. But he also uh, would do he, the, the Pelican Brief. Remember, he did that one after Consenting Adults. And that has political political well, elements I, I lump that in the same category, though. <laughs> and, and the Pelican Brief has political elements, and the Pelican Brief is inferior to presumed innocence. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. It's true. I'm not saying it's, it's not a, bad a bad movie. movie. I just, I just feel movie. like it's. I feel like it's different. I feel like it's a it is, different it is phase different. of his career. Uh, Alan Pakula decided not to make the same movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, it's, it's 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 fine an example of that kind of movie as you can fi- as you can yeah, find. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, uh, Problem Child came out that same day. The only thing that I you know like about Problem Child is Scorsese uses a scene from it in Cape Fear. <laughs> that's, that's exactly. Yes. Yeah. It's crazy that it's written by Scott Alexander and Larry Larry Karaszewski, who would go on yeah. to write, you know, Ed Wood and and uh, and you know, Autofocus and so many other. Yeah. You uh, kind of uh, wonder, people, you know, People versus Larry Flint. 
you kind of wonder, you know, because obviously the whole thing in, in Cape Fear is that they, that the the, the Katie family, the, I mean, the, the Bowden family has to go to a movie. And so <laughs> they have to go to a universal movie because, uh, you know. Oh, yeah, Cape Fear is a, because they Cape own Fear it, right. A, a universal movie. So, like, is this the only, so this was like, okay, what's the universal movie? And they're like, problem child. It's like, like there's nothing else. Like Martin nothing else to like, go at the time. I mean, well, I mean, I mean it's is about, that is it's, that it's sort a, of like a is that sort of like a kind of a dig towards? Uh, I mean, if you if you try and give Scorsese the benefit of a doubt, and he said, "Oh, I really tried to p- pick the right movie," so Problem Child because yeah. they have a Problem Child that is Julia. I don't, Lewis. I don't know if is that the reason. I don't know if he's making a dig. It could be. At, at, I don't know if he's making a, like a meta joke or. He's like just like you know trying to be like time accurate like oh summer well, listen, listen. I mean yeah. it's a, it, I mean it's about a child that wrecks havoc on a family it's about an element that wrecks yeah. havoc in the home so that's uh-huh. one yeah. thing you could look at it that way that's, you can also okay. look at it as as Max Cady's first sin that he commits against the, the Bodens is the desecration of the movie going experience yeah. which is very personal to Scorsese. And, to the uh, point where he's maybe, smoking a cigar in the middle of the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so maybe the, the existence of Problem Child itself to Scorsese was a desecration of cinema. I don't know. I think you know, I think know. that's a I think that's a good. And by the way, what you were saying earlier about comedy uh, uh, with Quick Change, Aaron and and yeah. Freshman. Well, here we have Problem Child, which is a, uh, a sort of a a. a Kind of there to let us know where we're going. I guess it was a hit because they made a sequel the following summer, Um, and I would I I like to point out that even at age eleven, going on twelve, I did not go see problem. Even I was like, you know what, I I know that game targeted at me. I'm glad I I didn't. I didn't go. (laughs) Okay, uh, August first is Young Guns two. Aaron, you like Young Guns two, don't you? I actually I. Actually, I do like Young Guns too. I think it's a it's a fun, you know, it's a fun B western. That's all it is. It looks good, actually. The director is um, what's his name? Jeff. I forget his name. Jeff. Uh, Jeff Murphy. He's a Jeff, uh, Australian director, I think. Yeah, Australian director. So it looks good. I've always thought Emilio Estevez is a good Billy the Kid. I've always thought he's been fun in the role. Um, Christian Slater has a lot of fun. Um, so I, I've always and William Peterson as uh, Pat Garrett. So I I actually do like Young Guns too. Great Bon Jovi song. I do I say that unironically. I so, love yeah. that song. I think that song is is great. I I do it's think a good that's, that's too, a man. yeah it is. Oscar nominated rock and tune. Which I know, one is it? I know is, Jamie, it, is it one Blaze of Glory? Blaze of Glory. Blaze of Glory. Yeah. Blaze of Glory. <laughs> I know Jamie be cranking it when uh, he's alone. So hey, uh, I bet you any I bet you anything I've been to more Bon Jovi concerts than any of you guys have. I've been to three of them. <laughs> I've been to one. Dated, I mean, I dated I a girl that loved Bon all. Jovi, so I <laughs> took her to three concerts. You know. Hey, Bon Jovi, he does not phone it in. He puts on a show. He does not phone it in, people. Yeah. So Whatever. Young Guns. Yeah, young I like. I, I want to hear. I want to hear. I want to. I want that to be the, the title of the show. Bon Jovi does not phone it in. Yes. So Young Guns Two, Young Guns Two, and and I was and I I you know what Young Guns Two has such a had a loyal cult following that I guess it was five years ago now. I remember Entertainment Weekly did a article in their magazine. Uh, a friend of mine interviewed the screenwriter of the Young Guns Two. That's yeah, how I'm rabbit a cult. Fo- yes. That's how rabbit they have a cult following for Young Guns. Mm-hmm. Well, was it? Correct me if I'm wrong, but. After the first movie came out, people realized that the main draw of it was Emilio Estevez playing Billy the Kid. And so did he become, like, more front and center in Young Guns 2? Well, West, well, they, what they realized, because they, you know, you know, they had ended Young Guns 2 with, like, you know, little epithets at the end of how everyone died. And so, but it was such a hit, they're like, how can we get a sequel? And so then this... Uh, and I remember there was this myth, this story popped up that Billy the Kid hadn't died. In fact, that Billy the Kid had lived until the 1940s or 50s, yeah. supposedly, and that he demanded a pardon. So they came up with this uh, sequel of uh, this revisionist kind of little big man version 
of where Billy the Kid is an old man, and he's telling the reporter his life story about how right, right. he really died that night and right. what really happened. And so that's how they were able to... <laughs> they were doing a little big man on Okay. Yeah. Uh, August 3rd. Um, I l- I've always liked this Spike Lee movie, No Better Blues. I, I, I really liked it when it came out. I remember watching it. It's a great score. It's a very mm-hmm. lively direction. I love the the passion of... I don't, there's something like the end of Mo Better Blues when he's teaching his son how to play and he's being a strict disciplinarian, but then he lets him go outside to play. And then the camera roams from the from the apartment window to the street where the little girl's drawing in crown the mm. end. I just, mm-hmm. I mean, the yeah, that's a good movie. Just, just moved me so much. It's like the, the very ending of Jungle Fever, which I don't think is a movie that completely works, but the ending that everybody said, oh, God, what a terrible way to end the movie, where he h- hugs the prostitute and screams and the camera, like, zooms. I just love those those passionate flourishes and Spike Lee mm-hmm. yeah. films. Me too. Absolutely. I do too. Me too. Yeah. That's one of the things I like most about Spike Lee, just in general. Like his, um, it's what I miss about Spike Lee. Just completely surprise you at any at any moment. At least in this, at least in this um, this this phase of his career. Uh, right, right. I, I don't know that I he's doing that. it. I don't. I don't know that he's doing it now, but. Right. Um, well, the thing about Mo, I mean, if you accept the fact that Mo Better Blues is going to be, I guess, you know, a kind of a minor or mid-level film because it's yeah. coming after Do the Right Thing, and yeah. I think a lot of people had to, you know, that was the knock on it. Uh, yeah. Then, then you're, then there's a lot of reward to come from, and I think it does ramble. Um, it know, is like, a rambly movie. It gets yeah, a little you know dull, I think. But for you know me. what? I think, I think all. I think most Spike Lee movies ramble. And and those are some of the parts of Spike Lee movies that I love the most because they're not they're not reciting conversation that furthers the story, but mm-hmm. you're you feel what it's like to be in their company. I mean, you understand yeah, like them it, it, in a they, deeper way. They try way. and put you in that world, I think, and yeah. uh, and yeah. I think that's good. I, know, I mean, it's good, but it's like it's like Cassavetes. There's some Cassavetes where the rambling is part of the the story, and then it's rambling for rambling sake. So, like, well, sometimes you know. sometimes Cassavetes movies try and get you to a place where you wish that you could go home, like you're in the company yeah, of a whole bunch of people. Right, right. And I think that's by design. I think that you mm-hmm. that, that you wish that you could get away from these people, and and yeah, so that's, that's, I don't think that Mobiter Blues does that. But no, but, yeah, or, but, or, but what or, I'm saying is. The ram the rambling the ramblingness in Spike Lee films. Sometimes yeah, it does ramble on and sometimes the rambling is better than others. I think like yeah. the rambling quality in like a Crooklyn Yeah. You know, when you have like five, you know, kids, like, okay, you know you're gonna kind of be a little kind of lazy Saturday afternoon about it. And where I think in Mo Better Blues it can be a little forced in some of the scenes. But I agree. well I think it, I think it's a lot better than the rambling we find in Mumblecore. I mean, because yeah. first of all, it's oh. scripted, yeah, uh, and it and it has a snap to it, you know, mm-hmm. if nothing else. Well, that is the big problem with a lot of mumblecore. I mean, it's not. Well, it's a lot of that, that's a lot exactly of that what has, it is. I don't think they know what they're doing a lot of the time. Well, a lot of that has core. has finally drifted away from mumblecore because now the mumblecore crew have they've gotten into genre and they've gotten yeah. into structure. Uh, right. They're, They've gotten out of that phase of of uh, just turning on a camera and seeing what happens. You know, now you know. You look at their horror films, the mumblecore horror films. They're they're dealing with structure now. And yeah, right, right. And so, well, they don't want to do the same Spike. things that that they have already done before. Do you feel <laughs> like uh, Aaron? I'm asking Aaron this. <laughs> uh, do you feel like mumblecore has like has is not a thing anymore? Do you feel no, like I mean, that's it's it's you know it evolves like everything else it evolves. I mean it's like well I mean all you have you know, to do is watch the Andrew Bozowski's results and it's evolved big time. Um, yeah, I mean it's a level of professionalism has crept in to the work. It's still they can still have the same low budget principles of you know doing it on a shoestring, doing it with your friends, but you know now a level of professionalism has crept into the work. 
and mm-hmm. so therefore the the, the 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 stories and the and the out and the and the, and the product is going to be better. So you know. uh, that same day, and also to, to one more note about Mo Better Blues. I mean, it is kind of a tribute to his father and uh, who was a jazz father? musician and composer. Yeah, and that's an early Bill indicator, of, and an early indicator of what a star Denzel was going to be. Yeah, I, mean, uh-huh. I remember Denzel. Oh, yeah. I remember Denzel yeah. was not. Uh, he refused to take his shirt off for any of the love scenes. He was like, "I'm a married man. I'm not going to take my shirt off." And I don't know if he's taken his shirt off in movies before. I or, or yeah. since rather. That's an interesting thing. I don't really look for guys to take their shirts off, but, <laughs> uh, you know, he but was still, I have you to know. admit that now that I'm thinking about it, it seems like the last time that uh, Denzel took his shirt off was for Glory to get whipped. Well, yeah. Doesn't, yep. doesn't he uh, yep. have his shirt off in flight? I'm sure, you know, and he with the chick in flight. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Oh, he does. I, I, I think was, you're right. I was too busy looking at the chick. I mean, that, <laughs> you know, but uh, but the thing about you know, even though he had already won his Oscar for when Mo Better Blues came out, he he was still he had he had not become the all caps Denzel. Yeah, right. That we now know. And so, yeah. and it's one of the yeah. great kind of it's 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 a stand very standard story of the self centered artist who must learn to grow and bring people into his life, you know, be vulnerable. Uh there's like there's more to art to his life than his devotion to his art. And actually by letting those things in it can deepen his art. Uh so I I mean I like that general story. Okay, that same day what Whit Stillman's Metropolitan came out, made for four hundred and thirty thousand dollars, gross just under three. It was his arrival. I'm right? a I'm a huge yeah. I'm a huge fan of this. This is one of those. Yes. This is one of those it's cases great of, movie. Um, of a you know, you know. Now, if this movie was made today, it's one of those cases of uh, they would describe it as wow, the one percent actually has soul and humanity. Right. Uh, right. That's what the film. I mean, that's really what the film is. It it's showing us a very enclosed world of privilege, and it's showing that you know there's vulnerability and security and, you know, just like everyone else. And, uh, that's and there's a little bit of a, for me, uh, when I watch Metropolitan, I feel like a little bit of a throwback to, like, mid-'80s kind of indie filmmaking, you know, uh, where they're, where they're, you know, they're not trying to uh, do anything more than this one thing, you know. They're just, they're just, uh, uh, there's just something about it that seems so closed in, and uh, that's the kind of thing that like reminds me of of that era of filmmaking. You know that uh, I don't know. There's there's just this sort of like I don't know, almost a claustrophobic feeling to Metropolitan. That uh, yeah, I mean, it, he lets us in on an ecosystem that most people don't have privy to, and lets us see that it's an ecosystem that yes is filled with a lot of privilege, but is, has a lot of similarities to other ecosystems uh, with typical, you know, when you're dealing with 16-year-olds or 15-year-olds or 17-year-olds of any other mm-hmm. class strata. And um, I think on that level, it's just they just happen to be hyper or think they're hyper articulate when they're just hyper insecure like everyone else. Um, I mean, this was his breakthrough movie, wasn't it? I mean, yeah, no, it was. I mean, this is this is his first film. His father uh, was it. His father or grandfather was the one who coined the word uh, yuppie. Uh, that was like the famous trivia. On I Rich didn't Stillman. know that. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, it's a, it. This is an important. You know, it's funny. You said this was made for four hundred and thirty thousand dollars. You said. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that today, you know, you know, we think back then. Yeah, that's low budget. I know so many filmmakers who would today kill for that kind of money on Kickstarter and everything. Well, but that that was, that was big, that was big, that was uh, low budget for to shoot on film. For I mean, man. today he yeah, could yeah. shoot that film for yeah. a lot less, probably. Yeah, if yeah, you were yeah. In the same position. No, but it, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a good movie. I mean, he made you know the first you know he made a you know a trio of really great films starting from this one, and, he, and he, I mean the great Chris Eigman who was just so funny in these films. Um, just a scene stealer of epic proportions. Very funny. Oh yes. I mean he. But these. This is he's somebody really, this that is, he's somebody that I wish had had. I mean he's he's had a good career, but I wish that uh, I wish that he had found his the the right note. Uh, mm-hmm. Like I, I 
I don't feel like uh, I feel like he's a very solid performer, but I don't feel like he's found the uh, place for him. No, no, he, he um he between this and uh, Noah early Noah Bombeck, he was on fire, and he was even on um he was on a TV show, if I'm not mistaken, in 2000 and 2001. It's like that thing you know or something. He very short lived, but um. You know he's you know, but he just sort of disappeared after that. Um, I know okay, he while Jerry's the movie still, while Jerry's still on the phone, we'll go to August tenth. There's three well, movies that we'll talk the about. Okay. There's three movies that we'll talk about uh, on this day, but this one will probably get the most discussion because it has mm-hmm. in the past, and that's the two Jakes. Yeah. I do remember. Uh, I, 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 I remember uh, watching yeah, this. Might as well start off with that one. <laughs> I watched this the weekend it opened. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I was aware of the greatness of Chinatown. I was 16, and I was anxious to see the two Jakes. And I knew of all the turmoil that had happened leading mm-hmm. up to it. Yeah, we all Nicholson, did. Nicholson came in to salvage the movie. He said, just screw it. I'll direct it. Uh, and uh, this was a big chasm between he and uh, Robert Evans that lasted for a few years. But, uh, I mean, I do. Th- with all that being said... There's no way that it could be as good as Chinatown. No but way. I think that I think that Nicholson did as best a job as anyone could in directing the movie. I thought it was mm-hmm. directed with a lot of flair and class, and he did it as well as can be expected of anyone, really. Yeah. Um, I'm not yeah, sure I mean, about that. I think somebody else could have done it better. You was. Let me ask you this because you know we go back to the other one. You know, you. <laughs> I, 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 you know, the first thing I said walking out of the movie with my friend Mitch, um, I said it's a shame Roman Polanski didn't direct this. And I agree, given that was an impossibility at the time, I guess, it's a shame. I mean, do you think if he had directed it, it would have been? Uh, I don't think that it would have been better with somebody. It. In my opinion, it mm-hmm. would have been better with somebody who was a director and with Jack Nicholson concentrating only on his performance. That said, you know, I mean, we do have to worry about the screenplay too, which is a mess. Yeah, I think. Yeah, but and uh, and I and I think they were trying to even. I think there was too much pressure on these guys to do. <laughs> there was too much pressure yeah. to do. Uh, how can you how can you do a, a sequel to a movie like Chinatown and not have some kind of pressure on you to do the greatest screenplay that's. Uh, yeah, you just can't do it. No, you uh, can't. It's and, hard, and it's exhausting to even think about trying to. Well, do first it. of all, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't like Harvey Keitel. I've never liked him as an actor. But uh, well, you so don't like just Harvey pers- Keitel just in general? Just in general. I mean, that's personal uh, preference. You know, like, you know, uh, I thought he was good. Okay. Though, as Jack Berman. I think like, I think what, like, I think Polanski already did the movie. Uh, you know, so that's why he wouldn't come back to do the two Jakes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he already made as haunting a statement with these characters in this situation as he possibly could. And I mean, why go back to the well for something lesser? You know what? Right. I wouldn't have if I were were in the um, if I were in the the studio. You know, uh, I would I would try and get somebody like Alan Pakula to do it or, or something like that. I mean, Jack Nicholson. To get Jack Nicholson to do this while he's got to carry the movie like in front of the camera, it's just it's just a mistake. Yeah, but right look there. at what look at what he was faced with. I mean, this Nicholson did not want to direct the two Jakes. I mean, so when you when you put everything that was stacked against this project, I mean, he did a, he did a pretty good job. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, the, he had already. But that person. said, how, how I mean, if you were not a Nicholson or Chinatown or Robert Town fan, were would you go back and take a look at the two Jakes? I mean, like absolutely nobody. I'm, I'm actually interested in going back and looking at it. Personally. I would like to watch it again, but not many people went to go see it when it was out. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. Right. I mean, no, they I did. mean, one second. I mean, this is talk about talk about you know we were talking about you know six years between Gremlins movie. This is sixteen yeah. years between these. I mean, this is a whole other generation. I mean, mm-hmm. they waited way too long. I, so for I you, to, it was like a complete like, what is this? Well, no, I went to the theater to see it because I had seen Chinatown on on cassette. I'd seen Chinatown. I'd rented it, so I went and saw the two right, days. Right. 
And so I, I and I like the two jigs quite a bit. I, you know, at, at age twelve, I was not, I didn't have the critical baggage of right, right, of, uh, yeah. I didn't have the critical baggage of like, oh, Chinatown's the greatest script of all time. So yeah, how dare they make a sequel? I, I had rented Chinatown, really thought, oh, this is a great movie. They did a sequel. Let me go check that out. So I took two jigs on face value. And, yeah, the two Jakes is not Chinatown, but I wasn't expecting two Jakes to be Chinatown. So two Jakes on its own has its own kind of tone and mood. And if you listen, if you hear Robert Town tell the story, you know, it was part of this trilogy, and each one was going to talk about a different aspect. You know, the first one was water. Uh, the second one is what uh, oil or land out there. I think the third one was going to be about the highway system. Mm-hmm. So it was all about, so it was going to be That's three, what they just, should have made the second one about. It's about the highway system. They should have. That was going to be. It was already was done be, with uh, with Who Framed Roger Rabbit. If, <laughs> that was going to be. It was going to be in the. It was going to be in the fifties wow. with the highway Who system. Who Framed Roger Rabbit beat it to the punch. Yeah. Who Framed Roger Rabbit is the actual, actual sequel to Chinatown. I I do like Kaitel in it. I like the mirroring of of both Jake Gitty right, no, and I like Kytel in Jake too. Berman, uh, both their characters. I don't think the screenplay is a mess. I think it's complicated. It makes you have to pay well, attention. Well, that's what I'm saying is that it's too complicated, though. Sometimes, too, sometimes screenplays can get too complicated. Like I don't think it's like, any more complicated where am than I? Chinatown. I don't think it's any more complicated than Chinatown. If you can, oh, if you can follow I disagree, China, but If you can follow China, I know people who love Chinatown, but you know they have to watch Chinatown to be able to follow it. So if you can follow Chinatown, you should be able to follow Two Jakes. And as well, far as here's Nicholson's another thing too, though. That, here's another thing too, though. Chinatown has the benefit of Roman Polanski's viewpoint, his 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 direction that really uh, right. sharpens I mean, the screenplay. Whereas well, Nicholson's Nicholson's direction doesn't sharpen town screenplay for well, the problem. Well, the, well, not the problem, but the thing is, Chinatown is imbued with a cynical world view where to Jake is about is imbued with sadness. Mm-hmm. It's all of, it's just imbued with there sadness. There is that great scene. There is that great moment where Nicholson's looking through the photos and you see him crying and wiping away tears. Uh I do, I do remember that. Honest to God, I can't remember the plot of the two Jakes. I don't remember how the two Jakes ends. Yeah. Zero plot, zero it. recollection. Absolutely. And the thing and the other thing Nicholson, you know, Nicholson up until this point only had one official directing credit with the Drive, he said. But yeah. he had been ghost directing a couple of films. I mean, it's well, he directed uh, well Going known. South. Well, Going South, okay. Going South, films. which actually is a good movie, very good but movie. But not only yeah. that, but he was the unofficial director on Pritchie's Honor um, because uh, John Huston was in such alien hell mm-hmm. that Nicholson was basically his co director. All through Pritchie's honor, so Nicholson was no, you know, he was not a uh, a slouch as a director. He wasn't a novice, so, is what you're saying. He wasn't yeah. a novice director. I still so. think that I still think that even handing uh, somebody like Nicholson the role of doing this sequel to this particular movie. While I actually being in front of the camera playing the lead was too much for him. It's like I don't know, I, I mean, I, you know, and I think I think that he would agree with you. He, he would. Think would he, he, I think he probably would. He, he, he did, felt like he was between he a rock and a hard place. Uh, so yeah. He did, he, I think I think he uh, I think he rose to the occasion much to much the same way, and this is, and uh, you might uh, scoff at this, but much the same way I thought uh, Anthony Perkins did in Psycho Three. Well, I think that Anthony Perkins and Psycho, well, well, okay, Psycho Two, I think, and Anthony Perkins. Well, actually, I didn't even see Psycho Three, but uh, but Anthony Perkins and Psycho Two is 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 great. But uh, uh, with uh, I don't know, Psycho Three know. has it's some just, great humor. I, I will Psycho say Three this. has some great moments that are directed. I mean, 
you do feel that from Anthony Perkins. But um, I will say, I will say this: out of all the movies that we've talked about, the two Jakes will be the one that I would want to go back and take a look at again. I want to see it again too. I do too. Mm-hmm. I, I just, you know, when I talk about these kinds of movies with Nicholson, it just reminds me of how much I miss Nicholson. You know? Yeah, yeah. I think we I, all, I just we all miss do. Him. That's it. I mean, we that's just it. Miss, we just miss seeing him in a good movie. I mean, I want I want to see Nicholson again in a movie that I feel like I haven't seen a thousand a thousand times before, and the two Jakes would uh, would fulfill that. So. Yeah. Okay. That same day, uh, uh, I remember uh, going to the theater. Uh, I so desperately wanted to see Wild at Heart. This was the following weekend, and mm-hmm. my mother. I remember on Friday, on the opening Friday, my mother and I went to see Air America, and I just, the theater right across from the house that was playing Air America was Wild at Heart, and I just stared at this time, <laughs> Wild at Heart. I so wanted to go in there. And then so are we talking later, about Air America now, or are we talking yeah, we about are. Wild but, at Heart? But, but so, so I went to see Air America with my mother, but two days later I saw Wild at Heart, so uh, uh-huh. everything was great. But anyway, Air America, Air, Air, is Air, Air America, the second Mel Gibson movie that summer, Air America, Mel Gibson, Robert Downey Jr., one of the favorite experiences working with an actor was Downey Jr. working with Mel Gibson in that movie. They formed a strong bond. Right. Yeah, I, I bet they had a lot of fun. Uh, I bet they yeah. had a lot of fun on that movie. I bet the making of the movie is better than the actual movie. I, I yeah, you. yeah. I, th- I, I bet that this is kind of like the 90s version of like, uh, of like you know, Cannonball Run. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's, it's like it was a lot more fun to make how, this movie. You know. I guess this will indicate how I guess how bad the word of mouth on Bird on a Wire was because this is only two months after Bird on a Wire, and everyone's like, I'm not going to Air America. <laughs> <laughs> like, fool me once. Yes, fool. Uh, okay, that's the day. Actually, I didn't. What? I didn't. I, I did not see it in theaters. Uh, so no, I, I watched this on cable like year, years and, later. And by the way, this was directed by the other Roger Roger that I always Spot get. Roger Donaldson and Roger Spottiswood, who are are they both from uh, from Australia or Australia? No, what I will tell you, they, I get they do hold, They do hold a special place in my heart because Pauline Kael uh, singled them out as terrific filmmakers. She really like really picked them, championed them, and Spottiswood particularly for uh, Under Fire. Under Fire, and, uh, I love that movie. For Under Fire, and it's just, sadly, she could never bring herself to admit that, like, Under Fire, that Spottiswood would really be equivalent of what we call a one-hit wonder, and yeah. everything else was just, you know, not worthy to remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, the best did, thing that the best thing that he did after that was a, he did in 95, he did a great movie called Hiroshima for, for television. That was right, probably time. the the best. Uh, which which Bond film did he do? Didn't he do? Did he do the um, Tomorrow the Never World Dies? Of, Tomorrow yeah. Never Dies. Which is the one, okay, which so, is the one that I really like of the Brosnan. Okay, so he did a, he did another good movie. So yeah. between so it was fourteen years uh, under fire in eighty three and then Tomorrow Never Dies in ninety seven. So he's 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 so he's he's overdue for another. For another good movie now, unless he, I, I assume he's still alive. Uh, of course, of course, he'll probably be like a uh, invalid by the time he gets to that next great movie, and we'll have to have Jack Nicholson co-direct for him. Yes. So, <laughs> <there you go. laughs> the same day, Joel Schumacher's Flatliners. This is uh, another uh, Rat Pack movie. Style I, I saw galore. this in theaters. Style well, galore. only, I mean, it's not a really a Brat Pack movie, is it? I mean, it's got Kevin Bacon and Kiefer Sutherland, but it's no, not really. It's, it's, it's not a Brat It's just a, you know, hot it young has some actors. Of the, it has Keith, Keith Sutherland's in it, though, I mean. No, I mean, it was just a lot of the, the hot young talent at the time. I mean, yeah. Uh, no, but anyway, we, Bald- we, even, Bald- Oliver Platt was, even Oliver Platt was considered <laughs> part of that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is crazy. One of these actors is not like the other. Yeah. <laughs> I remember. Uh, I remember. I mean, I the whole I the whole thing that. was the, the the selling point. They tried to be, you know, respectful about it, but I mean, it was kind of hard not to do. Which you know, 
you know, Julia Roberts' first film since Pretty Woman. You know, you know, and they're like that it was, was an a ensemble. selling point. It's an ensemble, but it's Julia Roberts was in it, yeah. and the plot. And she got you know, married to Kiefer Sutherland. That bastard. Kiefer, so. uh, yeah. yeah. Oh I just yeah, remember, I mean, for Joel, about that. Uh, Joel Schumacher is one of Kiefer Sutherland's favorite directors that he's worked with. Like they like each other a lot. And I, I I love Joel Schumacher, but I mean, Flatliners is all about style. I mean, I remember it being like style overload and the yeah yeah the story I mean, the story itself not really interesting me being very ridiculous. But well, the one I, the, the, I don't the remember one it very story much. the one story that works throughout. And the one performing that works throughout the one that you hook into is the Kevin Bacon storyline. His is the one that you can kind of hook into. The uh, oh, okay. he's the one he he's the one that bullied someone and then goes and apologizes. Right. For right. Being a bully. Yeah. I do. So I vaguely remember that. That's the one you kind of hook into, and all the other ones you kind of you know are kind of like a little bit of a uh, overload. But I mean. Yeah, it's stylish. It's overdone, but it's I mean it's Schumacher's style. I mean they're in this abandoned church with like Prometheus statues and stuff. I mean it's it's pretty awesome. I mean all his missing was uh, was Robert Duvall as their medical instructor. Oh yeah, I forgot it's like about that. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like Robert Duvall was in it. No, yeah, that's all they Mormon. needed for. That's all they needed to uh, really sell the thing. I mean, it, Flatline is. I'll say this: Flatline is better than Vital Signs. Uh, yeah, the bowel movement. My memory of Flatliners is like Flatline. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't I think <laughs> like, like, like Flatline. I saw, like, yeah, Robert Duvall could sit there and say like, "Tires win a race, Cole." It's like that's what this <laughs> role would be. Uh, all right. I, I adrenaline. Remember adrenaline it. is what brings you back to life, Cole. <laughs> All right. I love, I love how you slip out. into this character. You love this character. I love <laughs> That's the difference to you and me, Cole. There's only so much I can do. <laughs> August 17th. August 17th, Exorcist 3, which surprised what George C. Scott in an Exorcist movie, that's something else, which, which has one of the best scare moments, no matter what you think of the rest of the movie. It has one of the best scare moments in, now, in, in I've heard, picture. I've actually heard I've heard this from many people. I've never seen Exorcist 3, but I've heard from many people that it has like one of the great scares of the last 30 years. Well, it does. And it, don't, it, don't it, give I mean, it away. Jump, don't give a, it a jump away. scare. It, it's a jump scare. Okay. The rest of the movie completely forgettable for me, but it's worth it for that one. That is it one when moment. is it when Ben Gardner's head pops up out of the water? No, it's uh, okay. it only lasts a second. Don't tell yeah. everybody what so, it is. But so but, one, one one second of The Exorcist Three is worth seeing. That's, okay. that's my glowing recommendation. But it I'm actually got it. actually better reviews than than Exorcist Two got. <laughs> <laughs> which which is odd. What's not odd? But I've grown to really like Exorcist too. Uh, 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 still recognizing that it's a bad movie, but it's a very special kind of bad movie that is so completely haywire imaginative. By uh, the way, but, I was just I just spent my uh, my Sunday afternoon uh, watching Zardoz again and i feel the same way about zardoz too it's like yeah, there's just yeah. something about it's <laughs> just so it's just so <laughs> fucking bad shit crazy it's loony. you yeah, just yeah, have yeah. to watch it it's just it's not well, exorcist 3 was actually number 1 at the box office i think like for a week that's how crazy it was <laughs> and, 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 it's crazy. And, it's, and it's interesting it's interesting to watch George C. scott and there's a lot mm-hmm. of great kind of conversations you know how the conversations between uh Jason Patrick's father, uh, Jason Miller, and uh, the cop in the first movie, how they just right. kind of let them riff back and forth, especially in that right. uh, that very closing scene that they cut out of the original cut. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a lot of that in this, too, where George, George C. Scott has a friendship with a priest or something or somebody. I Which can't is recall. not a surprise because it's directed and written by William Peter Blatty, who really yeah. But this was kind of they, his they, way of trying to do the kind of exorcist that he wanted 
that uh, eventually uh, they did later on uh, when they tried to recut The Exorcist. But does George C. Scott come up with terrible plot ideas for movies? Like, they're showing... <laughs> they're showing... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, they're, they're showing Treasure of the Sierra Madre down at the Fillmore tonight. <laughs> no, I think, that, I think that that's their thing. I think they go see movies together. Yeah. If I, if I oh, remember correctly. They're so bad in the... I, I hated that part in The Exorcist, the first episode. You know? <laughs> oh, oh, you did? I thought that was charming. I, I think that's charming. Yeah, because the one thing was, The Exorcist could use more of is charm. Charm. Uh, it does need a little bit of it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, that same day, that same day, Rick... Mor- I think this is the Rick Moranis, Steve Martin movie, My Blue Heaven. It's like it, it, Steve Martin plays a mob mm-hmm. boss. Yes. yes. Nora, Mo- Nora Ephron's... Uh, Witness, witness, uh, relocation program comedy. Yes, with Herbert Ross as the director. I mean, this is this is a long step away from Herbert Wa- Ross directing, you know, Pennies from Heaven for for Steve Martin or Footloose, so. for that matter, uh, <laughs> or Footloose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm actually I'm a Herbert Ross uh, devotee. Um, Me too. I mean, like, I really love, uh, I really love, well, I mean, I think that, uh, Pins from Heaven is one of the masterpieces of, uh, of the 80s. And, I mean, I like, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Footloose fan. Uh, yeah. Uh, his I mean, last like, movie, yeah. Boys on the Side, I think is, a, is incredible. Uh, yeah. Boys on the Side is an amazing film. Um, I tell but, you I mean, of, but, but I, I, I need to I need to know what do you think of of Pennies from Heaven? I mean, like because to me actually, that's I've, that's his movie that is just over the stratosphere. Like I've never I've never I've I've actually never seen it all the way through. I, I need what? to sit, I, mean, <laughs> I need to sit down and and force myself to get all the way through it. I watch I, it. I, I I'm a I I'm not a Dennis Potter devotee. So I, you that's know, a, I, that's okay. I'm not either. I mean, when so, I first watched it, the first time I watched <laughs> Pennies from Heaven, I was not a dense, I was not a devotee of anybody in yeah. in that in that thing. But the Pennies from Heaven is is one of the most masterful <laughs> pieces of filmmaking ever. And if you could only imagine watching Pennies from Heaven on the big screen, it would just blow you away. Like it, it, like just watching I, it on I, any smaller screen. But seriously, uh, I've liked a couple of the no, couple of the numbers I have seen. I have liked. I mean, of course, I love the walking, but I mean, I just haven't watched it from top to bottom. But Herbert, I mean, Herbert Ross is a good is a good director of of like set pieces. The thing about My Blue Heaven and Nora Ephron is usually good with comedy writing. It's just she, uh, I don't know. It's just something something from the page to. Performing it just kind of gets lost gets in the lost, uh, I think. I think you're right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we're going to skip over taking care of business. What is that? The Charlie Sheen. What is taking care of business? No, Charlie no, no. Sheen. That's that's oh. Jim Belushi. Don't insult Jim Belushi no. with, by confusing him with Charlie Sheen. <laughs> and I have to admit, I don't know anything about. Although J. J. Abrams <laughs> co-wrote the screenplay. <laughs> well, that's all you need to Which know. Which is pretty crazy. J. J. Abrams taking care of business. Is going to go on to make the new Star Wars, so that's pretty crazy. But uh, okay, so it's Sunday, August nineteenth, nineteen ninety, when I saw Wild at Heart for the first time, and I knew that the way I would, uh, I thought about movies changed when I watched Wild at Heart. Can so I that, ask you that, a question here? I have to ask you, what was it? I have to ask you, uh, I'm going to act as the interviewer here. What was it about Wild at Heart that just totally, and totally my, my follow for you? My follow-up question is, and do you think it was for the good? <laughs> but that's okay. Yeah, I, my, I, I, my, yeah. It was so, just. It was just so incredibly dynamic. And it was the first time where I felt in, entirely enveloped in a director's world. And it was so, such a unique 
environment, and unlike any was, other movie. Was there something about Dern and uh, was there something about Dern and Cage together that really yes. like? Yes, I mean, was it, it it, there was something about there, there was something about the the simplistic beauty of those two characters that they were iconoclastic. They were where they were uh, just totally. It was like they were, uh, I, and I have to say, I just watched it last year again uh, for the first time in a long time. Was it was it just their just sense of total fun together, uh, or well, and you uh, and you felt that you felt that they were. I, I felt that it was truly one of the one of the strongest, just undying passion love stories between the two of them. It, it just set amidst this world of chaos, like the, like the greatest purity set. It was the it the, it was the contrast in the movie that got me. Like the 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 very highest level of 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 love and passion set against a world so dark and violent and vile. Was uh, there never that, never any other movie before this that had ever ever even uh, touched on this? No, Cuckoo's Nest. I mean, I, I, there were there were lots of there was lots of movies prior to this that I felt informed me. But Wild at Heart w- was all of those movies. Like Wild at Heart mm-hmm. encompassed every single genre so seamlessly for me, and I mm-hmm. never experienced a, a world like that. It was uh, that's all that's all I can really articulate ab- about it. Um, it made me see the possibilities of movies in a new way. For me, when I went to see it in in New York, I went to see it at the same theater that, uh, you know, that theater that uh, Woody Allen and and um, and uh, Dank Eaton hang out outside of to yeah. watch the new Bergman movie <laughs> in in Annie Hall. That yeah. theater is on 68th Street, I think, and uh, that's the theater that I saw. Uh, the first night I saw Wild at Heart. And I have to remember uh, feeling a little disappointed because I was not ready for this kind of uh, committed love story to this movie. Uh, so I was, I, was, I was looking for something a little bit different, um, a little bit more like uh, the previous movie that really blew me away, which was Blue Velvet, and uh, I now I go back to it and I look at it and I see all of that Blue Velvet stuff in it. Uh, uh, but at the time, it uh, it didn't resonate with me, and I think because it's not a very wildly uh, it's not a very strongly plotted film. Um, it's it's a very episodic movie, um, and certainly, certainly one of its greatest episodes has to do with uh, you know that that great scene uh, with uh, Sherilyn Finn at the side of the road. Yeah, after yeah, yeah. that scene just blows me away, and. And actually, when I watched that scene, that particular scene, I said, this is a great movie right here. This is great. But I wasn't sure that it all hung together. And um, Well, it's not the masterpiece that Blue Velvet is. I mean, Blue Velvet, you truly feel like it's all, all, of, a, all of a piece, that, that everything contributes to the, to the whole in a very... A very expressive way, but in Wild at Heart, I mean, the the it's truly what its title is. All the pieces are so kind of loony and disjointed. I mean, it's a it's a crazy wild movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, and so I do recognize that Blue Velvet is a far superior movie in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of polish and and a cohesive. Self-contained vision, uh, but Wild the Heart is just the, a, a more dynamic experience for me. As, well, as the a one movie. thing that the one thing that and I the love, Blue Velvet and I love just have. one more thing. I I loved that he and he did this in Blue Velvet too. I love that he pulled elements from pop culture and interpret, interpreted them through the characters 
you know, mm-hmm. Americana, pop culture, Wizard of Oz, Elvis Presley, uh, The Good Witch, that kind of thing, it, 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 in a very unique way to describe character. Mm-hmm. Well, the one thing that that Wild at Heart had that uh, Blue Velvet didn't have is that incredible passion. You know, the incredible passion. I mean, you could say, oh, well, there was an incredible passion between, you know, uh, some of the characters in Blue Velvet, but no, nothing like Wild at Heart. I mean, nothing, right. n- nothing like that. And that's that's what really drove the film, and it drives it still today. I mean, to the point where you know you're going back to it, and uh, I find myself going back to it, and and uh, and I'm surprised at what maybe I missed the first time around. Uh, well, Sailor and Lula are one of the great romance romance couples in films for me. I mean, you know, I just love them. Yeah. Aaron, you have any thoughts? I agree. I I've always been kind of mixed on Wild at Heart, uh, just like I'm mixed on David Lynch. Uh, I believe that he's a filmmaker who, for about thirty years, has been trying to recapture what he did in Blue Velvet. He's still living under the shadow of the greatness that is Blue Velvet. Uh, his best work is when he adheres to a genre structure. You know, Elephant Man is a Broadway play. Blue Velvet is a Hitchcockian thriller. The first season of Twin Peaks follows the the structure of a of a network procedural mystery. Uh, you know, the straight story follows, you know, it's like a fam is a Walt Disney family photo family family film. So, you know, when he adheres to the conventions of genre is when he shines the most. But usually after he does these films, he feels the need to kind of indulge. And uh, it usually uh, you get these kind of films that a lot of people feel are his great works. You get You get a Wild at Heart, you get a... Inland Empire, you get a Lost Highway, you know, Fire Walk With Me, the incoherent, you know, dirges, and they just kind of, you know, they have flashes of greatness, but, you know, you don't know what's going on. You couldn't, you couldn't explain them what's going on from top to bottom, you know, but, you know. But you could, you could, uh, you could say that I think his greatest movie is, is uh, Eraserhead. And you could say that about his that movie, and even you know some people like even Kubrick said that Eraserhead was a movie that was impressive to him. Let's just put it that way. Well, I mean, his, some a lot of his movies are indulgent, <clears throat> but but Wild at Heart and Fire Walk with Me uh, uh, are favorites of mine. Uh, and I love Blue Velvet, and the rest in the 90s, 2000 period, I don't like. So I'm half and half with David Lynch. But uh, I mean, while, I, it I, I love this while it might not make logical story. sense, while it doesn't yeah. make logical sense for me, if I'm tuned into a David Lynch film, it makes emotional sense to me. He's yeah. it's kind of That's it's cool. kind of like a sense memory type of. Uh, a creative brainstorming. There's, there's like, just the feel of the movie leads you in these different directions, and you can either go with the flow or not. I mean, uh, but sometimes they wrong. work beautifully for me. There are stretches of the Wild of Heart that are truly bravura. I mean, yes, Nicholas Cage and Laura Dern are a great couple, so you have fun watching them for a while. And, and Willem Dafoe is pretty and, amazing in it too. Yeah, I mean the. The scene with Willem Dafoe terrorizing Laura Dern is kind of the centerpiece of the movie. Uh, but even then, basically, in, it's, it's an echo of you know Dennis Hopper, but it's still it's still a scary sequence. Uh, and Cheryl in a in a Laura, uh, was it Diane Ladd is terrific as yeah. the praised mother. Uh, she got nominated. I feel like it's. I feel like personally, I know. I feel personally that Wild at Heart is lesser David Lynch. 
but I still think that it's true uh, to his heart, you know. And I really, I don't think that he's made anything that isn't true to his heart at that particular time. No, I mean, it's like, just, it's just unfortunately sometimes it's just unfortunate what he's made. It's just been so, uh, you know, incoherent and inside his head that you know he's had to inflict it upon us. I mean. I defy well, it's anyone. like it's like it, it, I think I think that's a little unfair. I mean, I, I just think I I think that he's trying to like say, listen, this this is what's going on. If it's your deal, it's your deal, and if it's not, it's not, and that's fine, and that's okay. And so, but I I think I mean you know. I can't get past uh, Eraserhead. I mean, I think Eraserhead is his greatest movie because it really tells you who you're getting in bed with. You know, it's just like, it just says, man, man, if you're into this thing, here, here I am. See, and I have a, I, I have my my best friend does not get David Lynch at all. So he's like any one of my students, like anybody could do a David Lynch movie. I mean, it's just goofing around. No, you can't. And I, and I'm like, absolutely not. I you mean, can't. Every, you, every, everybody I've seen wants, a lot everybody of wants to David do Lynch. a David Lynch movie. Everybody I've wants seen a to lot do a David of, Lynch I mean, movie, and nobody you, can. I've seen, I've seen through going through uh, a lot of film festival, you know, wannabes and stuff like that. Like going through film festivals and looking through, uh, looking through new filmmakers who are trying to get into film festivals and so forth. I've seen them trying to do David Lynch, and it's it's pathetic. Yeah, you just can't well, do because it because they they don't they don't kind of they don't uh, have uh, it. They're they're setting out to 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 copy they're to hit, copy a vision that doesn't they're belong imitating. To them. Yeah, they're imitating, and it's so clear. And, and, and no to one deny can do it. to deny David Lynch in his particular voice, like my best friend does, is to deny what movies can be. Movies can transcend plot and logical sense and all of that. I mean, you don't look at a, uh, an abstract painting and say, "Well, this doesn't make sense." I mean, film exactly. can be can be so much more, you know. Exactly, and I mean that's why he really hasn't made, in my opinion, a bad movie. I mean, he really hasn't because everything that he's done has been uh, has been totally to his to his specifications uh and uh and I'm fascinated to step into that and world that, always that 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 is a that is a real dangerous criteria because I mean that's saying that you know Heaven's Gate was made to Michael Cimino's specifications and so therefore Heaven's Gate is not a bad movie Heaven's Gate is a bad Heaven's movie Heaven's Gate is also a movie I like <laughs> so, I mean like that's a, that's a movie I like what can I say? I mean, like, okay. I'm not, I'm not for every, every us. Uh, I mean, stroker you know, I'm not made for every. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are certain specifications <laughs> that, that don't need to be, <laughs> don't need to be reached. But okay, okay. August twenty second. Uh, let's go through these real quick. We just got two more weeks. Pump up the volume. August twenty second. Um, I always liked that film. Uh, it's yeah. A fantasy. But it's a teen fantasy, and uh, now it's a. I mean, you know, then it was a fantasy about you know a kid having a pirate radio station. So of course everyone at the time, well, that will never happen. Now it truly is a fantasy because yes. because obviously every kid in there, every kid can just have a podcast. Uh, so, exactly. So that that movie is such a. Uh, that An movie analog. is kind of a, that movie is kind of like a uh, a baby version of what we're doing now. Yeah, that movie is such an analog relic. It's kind of cute now. Yeah, it is. So I'm sure if you were to like show that to like an assembly of like, you know, a teenage assembly of juniors in high school, they'd be like, "What is? Why is he doing a pirate radio? What guy? Why doesn't he? <laughs> it's just, true. Why doesn't he just do a podcast? That that is actually possibly the most dated movie of, <laughs> of the entire twenty. Of the last 25 years. That is the most yes. dated film of the last 25 years. Just pump up the volume. Yeah. So, I but ja- okay. Jamie, the, the, Jamie, uh, that is where you got your moniker of Hard Jamie. 
right. Or Jamie. Well, not, 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 not if you ask any of my ex-girlfriends. All right. Mm. <laughs> uh, August 24th, Dark Man, Sam Raimi. I know this movie's uh, beloved by many people. It is. It's a, ter- it's a non-comic book uh, origin story that could have been a comic book movie. It's a you have to give it respect on that on that level alone. Like really trying to really trying to like go forth and take that whole uh, Batman ethos and just yeah. take it and run with it. Dark Man with the the theme song. Dark Man, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, with the great villain by the one and only Benny from Law from L.A. Law, Larry Drake. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big Dark Man fan, and, and oddly enough, not on Blu-ray. Uh, from at least hmm. that I, that's I'm surprising. A, at least at my last look, maybe it has been. But uh, and also Francis McDormand uh, in a non Coen Brothers film. Uh, so yeah, Dark Man, terrific. There's some great action in that movie. Big Dark Man fan, and I did love the I did love an interview Liam Neeson once gave in a magazine. When they were like going through his movies, and he was saying, "Oh, that one's awful." Oh, I remember that one. And he brought up Darkman. He's like, "Oh, oh yeah, I had a lot of fun on Darkman." He goes, "You know who likes that one?" He goes, "The brothers like Darkman a lot." Because I guess <laughs> a lot of the brothers come up to me and tell me how much they like Darkman. So, heard it from Liam Neeson. The brothers like Darkman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Only Liam Neeson can get away with saying the brothers like Darkman. Uh, Men at Work, which is Emilio Estevez and Charlie Sheen as Garbage Men, right? We need to talk yeah, about that. This, Emilio Estevez it, directed it, right? Yeah, this was his second directorial effort, and this was a After script wisdom. that he had. This is a script he had for five years. The, the story goes, he had this script back in '85, and it had a lot of heat to the point that uh, John Hughes said this was one of the best scripts that he had he had read. And so God. it was, yeah. So who now? Who knows? <laughs> now, so Jesus. who knows the version that John Hughes read versus the version that finally got made? Maybe mm. there actually was a version of that script where it's actually like a good movie. I like to. Or think maybe so. that just maybe that just goes to show that John Hughes is better at writing screenplays than reading them. I don't know. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? But I mean that that film was five year. That script had been around for for five. Because I read, I I just recently read the famous, infamous Rat Pack cover story on New York Magazine. Like it's online. So oh I started yeah. To read it, and it's a terrible profile. It's like it's it's a sexist profile. It's it's yeah. smug. It's anything. But but in it, they talk. The reporter talks about how Emilio is wanting to direct and how he just has this script about these two garbage men and John Hughes just wrote it and the reporter got this rare quote from John Hughes who, you know, wasn't giving interviews but he decided to talk to the reporter for, you know, 15 minutes and talk about, oh yeah, I did read Emilio's script. I think it's one of the best scripts I've read in the last couple of years. Emilio's going to go far with that screenplay. Uh, So I was like, holy shit. I was like, wow. And it took five years Okay. Last movie that we're going last movie that we're going to discuss is uh I mean we started out with Last Exit to Brooklyn essentially and we're ending with another joy joyful movie After Dark My Sweet mm. Jason Patrick oh. James James Mar- Foley directed. Terrific director does not direct enough. Yes. Uh, he I guess he he directed what I don't know the first season of House of Cards, he did a couple episodes. I don't know if he's done any other episodes. Um, I just found out they're finally going to release at close range on Blu-ray this year. Mm, that's good. Mm. That's I'm, good. I'm excited, man. At close range on Blu-ray. Uh, at close range. Who, who was After the Dark woman Man. in After Dark My Suit? Was it Rachel? Um, Rachel Ward. Rachel Ward. Ward, right. And remember, remember the any, anyone remember the HBO movie Fortress? Brian Brown's uh, wife. Yeah, with the uh, fortress where they they kidnap uh, the uh, the school kids, the three. Uh, I don't kidnapp- remember that. The three three kidnappers with like masks on and stuff. 
Anyway, I'm mm. choosing that. I remember, she 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 had heat for about uh, I guess a couple of years because remember she was well, against I mean, all lot. Well, I mean, you know, she first she she first appeared in in um, her debut movie with Sharky's Machine, you know. Right. Um, and so, then, uh, and, and then did, and then know, uh, Weird Science. No, no, that's Kelly LeBrock. Uh, her, <laughs> Kelly LeBrock, sorry. Her, her movie <laughs> was a uh, Against All Odds. Remember Jeff Against Bridges? All Odds. Right. That's right. And uh, right. it was a good movie. And then this was so, so, all this sweaty in the cave when Alex Harris <laughs> pops up. <laughs> you know, I have nightmares about that. Every time I'm with a woman, I'm just afraid that Alex Harris will pop up. Or By the Harris. way, here's something interesting. Here's a little tidbit of uh, uh, of um, uh, trivia. trivia. Jason Patrick, the lead in After, After Dark, My Sweet, is actually the grandson of Jackie Gleason. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> He's Jackie Gleason's grandson. Well, so, keeping the weight off. So, so Jason Miller <laughs> is, is the son of Jackie Gleason? J- J- Jason Patrick. Jason Patrick no, is the but Jason Patrick's grandson father is Jason of Jackie Miller. Gleason. Yes, but Jason Patrick's father is Jason Miller. So that means that right. Jason Miller's father is Jackie Gleason? Uh, no, uh, uh, the mother is uh okay. the mother is yeah okay so but Jason Patrick is clearly not the great one <laughs> yes uh, but, yeah. but, but uh after dark I, my sweet is a really great movie i think it's, uh, i think it's a really great movie and this was uh remember this was kind of the the one year renaissance of uh, jim thompson cuz he had this you had um uh, the Grifters later on. The Grifters, in the year. yes. Uh, and then, like I said, James Foley, like I said, at close range. He had also done a movie, a teen movie called Reckless, in back in '84. I with, remember uh, that. Aiden Quinn and Daryl Hannah. And Daryl uh, Hannah, yeah. Aiden Quinn acting all surly, you know, you know how now the real stretch for Aiden Quinn. Um, but yeah, James Foley, and then I always liked the James Foley film, uh, The Corrupter. With uh, Mark Wahlberg and Kelly and Fat. Oh. And um, I think Jamie's favorite James Foley is Two Bits. <laughs> two Bits, right. I knew you'd say two that. Two Bits. Two Bits. No, the projection, the projection Booth, uh, which is a great podcast, they just did an interview with James Foley for their Glen Gary Glenn Ross episode. They had James Foley and Ed Harris on that. So check Apparently. out that episode. Yeah. Mm. It's a good interview. James By the way, still, can I mention two other movies Patina. that were that were released this uh, really this cool. August? Uh, also, Akira Kurosawa's Dreams, which was really pretty pretty interesting, <laughs> and also uh, Nicholas Rogue's The Witches, uh, which was oh, uh, right. is a very underrated um, uh, kids movie. You know, very different from what you would expect from Nicholas Rogue. But uh, but I love uh, I love that character Silas Dreams, even though it it isn't uh, fully successful there uh, because it's a anthology movie and no anthology movie is fully successful. But uh, there are some show. pieces in it that are just superb. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there really is, and the imagery in that movie. And I uh, I also I, I did love. I think I love three of the pieces in that movie. I love the first yeah. one. I like the one where Scorsese is Van Gogh, and I liked uh, the one where the the dead soldiers in the tunnel. That you one. Remember that one? Oh, that, that, one that was is like superb. that was it. Is that, yeah. is that, that the one the with one. Richard Gere? No, that's no, Rhapsody in uh, August. No, uh, that's Rhapsody in Rhapsody. August. That was the yeah. later thing. But uh, but uh, that that sequence with the soldiers in the tunnel is the reason to watch it. And yeah. uh, the Scorsese thing with uh, him as Van Gogh is kind of like the, uh, the other. And there's a great sequence that, also that that takes place all in snow. Do you remember the uh-huh, very snowy uh-huh. sequence? That's just, yeah, and uh, then there's a piece with a volcano. 
yeah, it's 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 really uh, imagine. It feels there are moments that feel truly like a dream, which is what the movie is. But, yeah, uh, the imagery of that movie is just amazing. Yeah, so it's Scors- Scorsese plays Van Gogh. Yeah, yeah. And he and he's in the back of a taxi. <laughs> no, I mean he's he's essentially living his. Pa- I mean the 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 vignette is made to look like one of his paintings. I mean it's. Oh, okay. He's actually awesome. wandering amongst all of his paintings, actually. That would have been awesome yeah. if it was Van Gogh in the back of a, ta- back of a taxi. <laughs> and he'd be like, you, you Talking the, about what you it's like woman? to shoot a woman's genitalia or something? Yeah, you see a woman <laughs> in the window? You ever see? I cut my ear off woman. for that woman. You see that woman? You see that I cut my ear off for that woman. <laughs> That's what you, have you ever painted a woman? Ever painted she, got a woman my ear. A, she got my ear right now. You ever painted a woman okay. with a saber brush? That you should see. Painted a woman's vagina with a saber brush. That you should see. 